If you have your Bibles, if you please turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We are almost ending the Sermon on the Mount, sermon preached by our Lord. We are in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And it reads, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You may be seated. In about a few months, come June, uh, my wife and I will be celebrating 11 years of marriage. At, oh, okay, thank you. I didn't, wow, applause, wow. <laughs> I, I guess it is worth applause given our divorce rate among Christians, so-called Christians in this country. But we will be embarking on 11 years if the Lord allows us to, to see uh, June 3rd of this, uh, this year. And I, I'm reminded of how all of this came to be uh, just almost 11 years ago. Um, I remember us standing before the minister exchanging vows and, and, and promising to do certain things for each other, to love, honor, and, and to cherish, and to, and to place ourselves uh, uh, second to our spouse's needs and, and so forth and, and so on. I remember my wife saying to love, honor, and obey, because that was the word that was used. In, in, in the church that we was attending. Very uh, bygone word now, but nonetheless, the word obey is used, and we'll use that, hopefully in the couple that we're going to be marrying uh, very soon. <laughs> that word will be used in our wedding vows of exchange. We'll make sure we incorporate that. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm reminded of how all of that came to be. It was more than just people coming to see two people be wedded in holy matrimony. It's more than just people coming to eat food and to, and to celebrate um, that joyous occasion. But I, I believe that most of it, looking back on it, was based not only on our love for each other, but our love for each other based and lived out through commitment. Commitment in these days and times is very shallow. People say one thing and do another thing. You go to the car dealership and you say you want this kind of car and you ask them, do these type of features come with the car? And they say, yes, it comes with the car, only to find out that those were optional features that we didn't read the fine print on. Because people have one way of saying things but not backing up what they say. They're, they're, we, we, we live in an uncommitted society where people are not committing themselves to each other. They would rather shack up. They would rather have what they can get from a person instead of giving their lives through that person in a committed relationship. It's no different than our Lord. The same attitude that we have and that we see and that we experience in this earth is the same attitude that our Lord talks about in his Sermon on the Mount to the multitudes and to those who were listening to him on that day. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, God cares less about what we say. What we say does not matter if what we say is not backed up by what we show. A lot of times people say that they're Christians, but we can never tell who is Christian or not. Because what they say is not backed up by how they live. Their, their life and their lips do not coexist. And this is the same attitude, this is the same action that Jesus is bringing forward. And he's now giving application. And we studied that even on last week. He just didn't just give them a sermon, but he tells them, this is how you get into the kingdom. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. Look again at verse 21 to 23. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We're going to look at a few things this morning. Number one, mere verbal profession does not guarantee eternal salvation. So you got a lot of amens on that one. Say that again. Mere verbal 
profession does not guarantee eternal salvation. Why? Look at the text again. Verse 21. Jesus says, not how many people? Everyone. Everyone. Do you see that? Not everyone. So the implication is people who think that they're getting in are not going to get in. And I tell people this all the time. Heaven is limited. It is. I didn't limit it. God limited it. How do we know that God limited? Remember we talked about last week? Look again at verse 20. He says, so then you would know the body of fruit. Some of the false teachers are false prophets, correct? He talks about the good and bad tree, verse 18 and verse 17. He talks about every good tree bears good fruit. So if every good tree bears good fruit, then he's distinguishing the good from the bad. Those that that, that possess bad fruit don't get into the kingdom. They don't get into the kingdom. He says in verse 20, 13 to 14, strive to enter into the narrow gate. He says, why? For the gate is wide, the way is broad, that leads to destruction, and many are those that enter it. Verse 14, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow, that leads to life. And how many are those who enter it there? Few. Few. Heaven is limited to few. But if you listen to people talk today, heaven is going to be full of people. People that you and I know ain't no more saved than Satan's sister. People whose life have no resemblance to kingdom living at all. As if hell has a vacancy sign attached to it. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody saying that they're going to hell unless you cussed them out? Mm-hmm. Or unless you've been cussed out? Because nobody here will do that. But you know, people, other people that you know. Hell, hell is vacant. N- nobody's going to hell. According to modern popular opinion, nobody goes to hell. Mm-hmm. Except those that we're angry or upset at. Jesus says, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So we see mere verbal profession does not guarantee eternal salvation. Who cares what you say? Christ does not care if what we say does not line up with what we, how we live and what we show. Amen. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 says this. Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with what? Their lip service. But they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. You know what rote is? You just regurgitating stuff. You're just saying what somebody else says. You, you don't know it for yourself. It's the whole Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. We all know the song. But the impact, the implication of that could we articulate that in our own words? You just you just memorizing stuff for the sake of memory. Yeah, you know the information, but do you really know the information? Have you experienced what you will say that you're knowing? Because these people learn it by just rote, just by common everyday regurgitation and repetition of statements. And it could be true. But the issue is, are you living the truth out in your life? Mere verbal profession does not guarantee eternal salvation. Turn to Matthew 15, verse 7 through 8. Matthew 15, verses 7 through 8. This is Jesus, again, rebuking and, 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 and admonishing the, the Pharisees and the scribes about them putting their tradition over God's truth. Verse 7 says, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but what? Yeah. <laughs> their heart. It starts with the heart. It always starts with the heart. But their heart is far away from me. It's far away from me. Mere verbal profession does not guarantee eternal salvation. Number two, those who say but never show habitual patterns of obedience to Christ's lordship will not enter heaven. Look again at verse 21 in your text. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Christ gives a statement of fact. He's not giving an opinion here. And and guess what? Neither should we. Mm. When someone asks you or I, is everyone going to heaven? The last thing should ever come out of your mouth or should never come out of your mouth is, I don't know. Never should you say that. Because Christ says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to heaven. We are to say only what Christ says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So again, it's not about what we're saying. 
Well, I, I signed. A, I signed a, a card, right? I walked an aisle, right? Somebody laid hands on me, right? I understand all that. All that's outward stuff. What happened inside the heart? And, and, and has what has happened inside the heart been expressed and been seen by patterns of obedience? Now notice what I'm saying. I'm not saying perfected patterns. Why? Because we won't be perfect on, in this life. But is the course of your life and my life consistent patterns of obedience with occasional breaks of disobedience? That's the issue. And Christ does not care about who your mama or who your daddy is or, or what church you came from and how many people that they've ministered to and how many chicken dinners they sold and how many cars they washed. None of that matters if your life is not consistent to faithful, godly obedience. Turn to Matthew 21, 28. Matthew 21, 28. Let's look at some examples this morning. Matthew 21, verses 28 through 31. He says, but what did you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Verse 30. The man came to the second and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. The first. You have two people. One saying that he'll do it. The other person saying that he'll do it and he didn't do it. Notice what Jesus is saying. It doesn't matter what you say if what you say is not backed up by what you show. How many of you have heard or seen people that, that, that claim to be a follower of Christ they, 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 they're involved in ministry they, they do this, they do that Oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Oh, I'm going to beat it to God. But they're filing for a divorce. Unbiblically. They're doing things that are contrary to what God's word says. But they say Christ is their Lord. And Christ says, if I'm your Lord, you are to follow what I say to do. We live in a society today where Christianity is a joke. But people look at you and I as basically being extinct. We're rare. We, we're, not, we're not the kind of people that they think are Christians. They call us weird. Even more recently, now we're being called a cult. Because we want to think the way God thinks. We want to do what God says. And doing what God says does not always put you and I in a popular place. Let alone positive. But it's about us showing habitual patterns of obedience. That's the key. Is your life focused and directed toward pleasing God? That's the issue. If it's not, you're not saved. You're not saved, you're being deceived. Luke chapter 3, verse 8. The A part says, Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with what? Repentance. Repentance. Oh, what was that? It's turning from sin and turning to God. That's repentance. If you're not turning from your sin, then you have not repented. Why? That's what the Bible says. He says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. You want to know what a person is, is really repentant? Look at their life. We're not talking about a person that can't ever sin again. Okay? But we're saying that a person's attitude and their actions should be consistent with biblical repentance. And it doesn't even mean that the person can't fall back into that same sin. But how does that person respond when he or she falls back into that sin? Do they make excuses? Oh, God knows my heart. Oh, God understands. No, no, he does not understand that. He, he has given us the power to say no to sin. But when we fall into sin, what is our attitude? What is our reaction toward that unrighteous attitude, word, or action? What is our attitude toward that? John 3.36. It says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not what? 
notice now now notice now this this is something that I, I gotta kinda like just touch on a little bit. Because when we talk about lordship, I'm not sure if y'all y'all have heard that term before, or the term lordship salvation. Uh, depending on what you think about that, I hope you thinking what the word of God says about it. Although, oh, lordship salvation is not in the Bible, neither is the word Bible in the Bible. Okay? So we're not talking about making uh, issues out of, out of small matters. We're talking about a teaching that we can see in Scripture and use that as a practice of doctrine for us to follow. Christ says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see what? Life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Would it, would it be safe to assume and to even confidently assert that obeying ties into believing? Because if it's not, then why would Jesus just not say he who does not believe? Well, if I don't believe, I'm not going to obey. Does that make sense? Amen. So Jesus says, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. And by the way, that is a pattern of life. We're talking about a pattern of life. We're not talking about one time you disobey, oh, well, you're out. No, this is a pattern of obedience or disobedience to God. If my life is disobedient, if my life gives no evidence to being a follower of Christ, I am not saved. He says, he who believes in the Son has it. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God. Oh, we don't like that. Oh, my God doesn't send anybody to hell. Well, you got the wrong God. Because my God does. All the time. He, he's the God of wrath as well as a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace. We all want to look at one side of the coin. There's two sides of that godly coin. That there's, there's a positive side to God and there's a negative side to God. Negative in the sense that if we get on his bad side, it's not going to be a good day for us. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Let's look at some other passages, shall we? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's look at how we can tell if a person is habitually being disobedient, giving evidence of not being saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you see that? He says, do you not know this? I, you, you should know this. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, I ain't, I, that's not me. He ain't talking about me. I'm not unrighteous. Okay, Paul said, let's go on then. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Uh, uh, that word effeminate is a male acting like a female being the female recipient in a homosexual act. This is the person that is the passive individual in the homosexual act. Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines it as this way. It is also a person who uh, has attitudes and characteristics of a female. Wow. Uh, this person acts feminine, although he is male. It's not my definition. You can look it up for yourself. God says it's attitude and Action. The Bible says a man thinks in his heart, what? So is he. He says, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, <laughs> nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Now, 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 the reason why I'm touching that a little bit, because homosexuality is not always a person that's basically uh, being the male counterpart. It can be both acts. It can be both acts. Or you can use the term lesbianism in there as well. Okay? So you're having people acting like the opposite sex, although they're not. 
the opposite sex. He says, this is the pattern of your life. If this is, this is what characterizes your life, look at verse 10. Nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers. You know what a reviler is? That's the person that accuses people. Falsely. False accusers. Slanderers. Blasphemers. He says, nor swindlers. You know what a swindler is? A person who takes advantage of people knowing that they're doing wrong. He says, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to heaven. You're going to hell. If this is the pattern of your life, God says you have no reason to assume nor believe that you're saved. And these are all habitual patterns in the original Greek language. These are characteristics of a person that is not truly saved. I had a Bible professor teach and tell me in class that shall not inherit the kingdom of God means you just lose rewards. I'm like, what? What? And that's all it means. Why? Why? Because he's anti-lordship. Plus, he had a 10-year affair with, with another woman that wasn't his wife. Teaching at a Bible college. For 10 years. Committing adultery. Highly respected at the college at that time. Teaching theology at a very reputable school. But yet, when it came to this particular passage of Scripture, and a few others as we turn to it, oh, that's just loss of rewards. But this is the same kingdom of God that Christ uses in Matthew 7. Is it not? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, no, with kingdom of heaven, I mean kingdom of God. Remember, Christ is talking to a Jewish audience. They didn't use the word God because the word God was holy to them. So heaven represented God. Are y'all following me while I'm saying this? So we're talking about shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We're not talking about loss of works. We're talking about the loss of a person's soul. This person goes to hell if they practice these kinds of deeds. And we're not talking about perfection. Can a Christian commit these acts? Yes, they can. Y'all got quiet on that one. A Christian can commit this. A Christian can do this, but it should not be the pattern of a Christian's life. Mm-hmm. All of us have done something like this before. I'm talking about post-Christ. I'm not even talking about pre. Let's look at some other passages of Scripture. Galatians 5. Y'all getting quiet. I like that. Mm-hmm. Galatians 5, 19-21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. You see that? <laughs> he says it's evident. You don't have to guess at this. Which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions. Dissensions. Splitting the church up. Causing factions and frictions. Factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing. And things like these, in case he missed it. And which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who what? Practice. Practice. Those who practice such things, here's that word again, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Turn to Ephesians, one book over, chapter 5, verse 3. Are y'all getting this? Mm-hmm. Ephesians 5, 3. But do not let any immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as proper among saints. And there must not be no filthiness, and silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, there's no reason to doubt this, that no immoral, or impure person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You're not even in the kingdom if you're doing this. You're not even a child of Christ, a child of God at all. You're not even a follower of the kingdom of God if this is your lifestyle. 
And notice, and notice how he does, how Paul lumps all of this together in verse 5. Look at the B part of verse 5. He says, impure person, a covetous man, who is an idolater, right? When we talked about earlier, you are what you worship. We all worship something. The question is, is our worship drawing us closer to God or is it drawing us away from God? If it's drawing you and I away from God, you're not saved. If this is the pattern of your life. So idolatry is more than just somebody worshiping a statue or some stone. Idolatry is anything or anyone that we place above God. <coughs> so Paul just puts it all together and says, who is an idolater? Because it starts with what we worship. But look at verse 6. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. No one. Not me. Not your brothers or sisters, not your mother, not your co-worker. God says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Vain, futile words. Meaningless words. Oh, that doesn't mean that. Well, what does that mean? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God means exactly what it says. There's no third level reigning and ruling with Christ. Oh, you're going to be in the corner in, in, in the kingdom. Everybody else will be serving God. No, you're going to be in hell. That's where you're going to be. So you see, this is, this is not a person that lives in such a way to where he can say, oh, I'm, I'm saved uh, and have no desire for change. That's contrary to Scripture. Paul says, he who began a good work, Philippians 1, 6, shall do what? Com- complete it. Finish it. If God starts it, he will finish it. He will finish it. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. <laughs> I mean, there's no guessing games when it comes to sin and what sin leads to and where it will lead you to. He says, it is obvious. Anyone who does not what? Practice. Practice. Practice righteousness is not of who? Uh, does that mean you're not saved? Yes. Right. That's what it means, right? right? So I'm not making it up. He says, you don't even belong to God. He says, nor the one who does not love his brother. Uh Uh-oh. If I love joy, if I say that I have godly love for her, I'm not going to do anything that will try to destroy, demean, discredit her as a pattern of life. Is that a safe assessment to make? Mm -hmm. If, If I love Brother Alfonso, I'm not going to try to do anything to destroy him or anyone else. Love is not just by words, people. It is by action. Remember, God so loved the world that he what? He gave. So if I love you, it's going to be seen in how I treat you. So God says, a person that doesn't love his brother, you're not saved. And how many people we know that are walking around with bitterness in their heart towards someone else? Resentment, anger. Hostility, malice. And this is the course and pattern of their life. They are sitting back, thinking and looking of ways to try to destroy another individual. That is not of God. And that person is not a Christian. Why? That's what the Bible says. The Word of God is clear. He said it's obvious. You can see that by how a person responds to sin. How do they see what they're doing? Do they see the way God sees it, or do they see the way they want to see it? Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, we're going to talk about the second death later on. We're going to talk about the second death in a minute. Trust me, because I know it's going to throw some of us off, but don't worry. We're going to to walk it through because it's in the text we're talking about. In Matthew's gospel, with Jesus saying, depart from me, I never knew you. There's a timeline on where Jesus is judging them when he's talking about that day. There is a that day that he's talking about. So let's turn back to Matthew. Matthew 7, let's turn back there. Verse 20, excuse me, verse 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but he who does the will of my Father. <clears throat> Notice, but he who does. The word does, again, in the original language is dealing with a pattern and course of life. It's not just a one-time thing. This is the course of a person's life. If a person is saying that they're a Christian, they should act like a Christian. So number three, those, only those who habitually practice righteousness and seek to do the will of God will enter heaven. Psalm 40, verse 8. He says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Question, do you delight in obeying God? Amen. Amen. Oh, okay. Let's make sure everybody is awake. Because if we don't delight in God, if we don't delight in doing His will, we have no reason to think that we're saved. Think about the things you delight in. You delight in a good meal, a good night's nice rest. Sometimes you may delight in just getting away for a moment. It brings you pleasure. It brings you joy. That same thing, magnified at times infinity, that should be our attitude toward being obedient to God. Because He knows what's best for us. I delight in God's Word. I delight in doing things that please Him. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in what? Righteousness. Righteousness. <laughs> and he's not talking about positional righteousness. He's talking about practical righteousness. How we live gives evidence to who we obey. Think about that. I want, I want to read it this. Sink in to your brain. Anytime we do something, right or wrong, somebody is ruling. Somebody is master. Somebody is an authority. Either God is an authority or Satan is an authority. Now you may think, well, what about me? You are never in authority of your own life. Never. You are a slave to somebody. You are either a slave to Satan or you're a slave to God. I got my own mind. No, you didn't. You thought you had your mind. Satan was pimping you until you got saved. He says, or of obedience, righteous conduct, which evidences a righteous life and a righteous relationship to God. Again, it is not what we say. Too many people are being told that they're saved because they prayed a prayer. They signed a card. They repeated. And this is why we don't do it at our church. When we, when, when we witness to people, we lead people to Christ. Oh, let me just say what I do. Maybe some of y'all may do it. You may now have to change how y'all been doing it. It's probably why you haven't got too many conversions. But anyway, uh, when you win someone or strive to win someone to Christ, number one, we know it is not by our own skill. We don't have any skill. Okay? This is not our message. This is Christ's message. We're ambassadors. But number two, just a, just a suggestion. Because I don't see anywhere in Scripture where Jesus said, pray this prayer after me. Do you? I, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says, lift up your hands and, and, and just, just, just receive it. Receive what? <laughs> what am I receiving? <laughs> what, what do you want me to receive? I, I don't see that in it. I don't see that here. What I do see is repent. What I do see is turn from your wicked ways. What I do see is confess him as Lord. I, I see that. Well, so why am I saying that? Well, let me give you, just give you some practical suggestions. Let me give you just one. If someone offended you, right? Let's just say I, I, I offended Toronto. Okay, Toronto, I, I, I offended Toronto. And everybody knows that I offended her. I, I sinned against her. I did wrong. I stepped on her foot. I slapped her side of the head. I did something. It was obvious that, that she got offended, okay? Now, hopefully she don't, she don't offend me back. <laughs> but nonetheless, she's offended because of something that I did to her. And everyone knows this. And since you know this, you're saying, Seiko, you were wrong for sinning against this sister. You need to go make it right. That's, 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 that's correct, right? I need to make right the person that I've offended 
by my actions, right? Okay, so then I go to this person, but I want, I want, I want Alfonso to go with me. I, I need you to go. And he's like, dude, are you serious? I didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but I, I'm, I, I want you to tell her that I'm sorry. Does that make any sense? No. Why? Because he wasn't the one that hit her. I hit her. I sinned against her. So since I sinned against her, I'm responsible to the one that I offended. Mm-hmm. So I don't need Alfonso to write up a letter. I don't need Alfonso to say, okay, all right, say go. All right, here, uh, you know, turn around to you right here. Yeah, I'm here. And she holding her face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm here. <coughs> okay, Seiko, you, you, you asked her to say? Yeah, okay. What, 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 okay, Seiko, say that to me. Uh, Taronda, Taronda, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for, for, for offending you, for, for hitting you, for hitting you. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? How would she respond to that? Would she take that as being genuine or scripted? Why do we do that to God? We offended a holy and righteous God. We did that. Individually. The Bible says all have sinned and, and come short and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, no not one. Every last one of us have sinned against a holy and righteous God and we want to get a preacher or somebody else to tell God that we're sorry? I mean, th- th- just think about that. I don't need my mom or my daddy to come before. You're not my mediator. Christ is my mediator. Amen. So I'm supposed to go to him, Lord. I am sorry for what, Lord, forgive me for sinning against you. I've offended you. Lord, please save me. Now, I'm not saying that when people pray the quote unquote sinner's prayer, although it's not in the Bible, that person can't be saved by that. But what I am saying, it gives people the illusion and the false assurance that they are saved because they pray the prayer. Amen. They're reading a script. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, hey, forgive me for my sins, forgive me for my sins. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, you got saved. Friend, no, you didn't. If it's not heartfelt, if it's not sincere, if it's not wrought by the Spirit and power of God, you know you're not. Quit telling people to pray after me. No. Oh no, you, you, you did wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, you sinned against God. Right? I, I, I already got my relationship with God straight. Me and him good right now. No, no, you sin. you tell God how you sinned against him. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to say. Say whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to say. But make sure what you say to him is that you're asking him for forgiveness. you wanting God to save you. Mm-hmm. That is how you share the gospel. You're a sinner. That's, that's the bad news. You, you sinned against God. The good news is, if you trust in him as Savior and Lord, both, not just one. You can't have one without the other. You've got to have both. If he's good enough to save you, then he's good enough to, to be your Lord. Amen. If you sin against a righteous and holy God, you need to make that situation right before a righteous and holy God. You need to repent. You need to accept <laughs> the gospel as what Christ says the gospel is. Repent from your sins and believe the gospel. Mm-hmm. That he died for your sins. And if you believe that, you're saved. Not this quoting somebody else's prayer. And act, no, no. You did, it, you did it wrong. You make it right with God. But we don't hear that today. What we hear today is, okay, you know, just repeat after me. Sign this card. Walk down this aisle. And get everybody else following you. And, and, and peer pressure is something else. Mm-hmm. Peer pressure is something. That's why I don't do altar calls. Well, he do altar calls. There's only a few of us in here. That ain't the point. (laughs) Even if we did have a lot of people in here, there would be no need for me to do an altar call. Why? Because I don't want to do anything that leads people to believe that if you walk an aisle, that that means that you're saved. You can get saved at your seat. You can be saved in your car. You can be saved in the bathroom. You can be saved laying on a couch. You can be saved anywhere. God, the Bible says, his arm is not too short where he can't save. He can save, the Bible says, to the uttermost. But only those who habitually practice righteousness and seek to do the will of God will enter heaven. Romans 7, verse 15 and 19. 
Notice what it says. Now notice, this is a pattern of life. Okay? I'm not talking about perfection. MacArthur calls it not perfection, but the direction of our life should be to be obedient and pleasing to God. He says, Paul said this, this is, this is, this is a, a Fonzo's favorite verse, I believe. He says, for what, am I, what, what I'm doing, I do not understand. Why? For I am not practicing what I like to what? Mm-hmm. This is Paul saying, this, the one that wrote 13 letters. Mm-hmm. The apostle, Paul. Th- third heaven, vision, Paul. Seeing heaven, saying, man, I can't do heaven so bad, but y'all have to get there, boy. Y'all going, ooh. And this is that Paul. And he's writing and saying, I got sin issues too. I don't have it all right. He says, I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing he what? I hate. hate. (laughs) Question, do you hate sin? Do do you really hate it? If you could could remove yourself from that whatever it is, would you do it? Would you, would, you, would you try to do everything in your power, never to do that again? Then if that's, your, if that's your attitude, that shows that you have a righteous relationship with Christ. It's one of the evidences of being a Christian that you are saying, I don't want to do that. This is, this is not what I want to do. I'm hating the very thing. When I say, I, God, oh, ah, you, that's how you feel. You, you don't even want to go outside. You don't, you don't want to talk to anybody on the phone. That's how bad you feel. Mm-hmm. Because your sin has violated God's holy standard. Verse 19 says, For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. See, that's the sin struggle. Every last one of us in this room we got a sin struggle. You shouldn't be sitting in sin, you should be struggling with sin. Doing war with sin. Not making excuses for it. But doing battle with sin. Colossians. Turn to Colossians chapter 1 verse 22. Colossians 1 22. It says, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless beyond reproach. Look at verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith. You see that? Don't, don't think that you're saved if you're not finishing with what, what, what you're supposed to be finishing. I, I, I remember a person that got saved and they, they're not saved no more. They never got saved. If, if a person claims to be saved they're no longer saved, then you need to question whether that person was ever saved to begin with. Because then that attacks the doctrine of eternal security. Mm-hmm. Christ says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them. And they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my father's hand. Hmm. My father who is greater than all, no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. That's what the Bible says. Paul says in Romans 8, what shall separate us from the love of God? Hmm. So tribulation, distress, persecution, nakedness, peril, sword. He goes on and on and on. No. He says, I am confident that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Hmm. Nothing. Not even you. Demons? No. You? No. Persecutions? No. Issues? No. Attitudes? No. no. Nothing can separate you from God if you are truly saved. Look again at verse 23. It says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. You're not being, you're not being suckered and drawn away of the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3.14, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast. See, it's not just you, oh, I, I'm saved. No, no. Are you holding fast? Are you persevering? You, are you not, you're not whipping out? You're not just letting go when times get hard? No, are you holding fast? He says, the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. Chapter 5, verse 9 says, And having been made perfect, he became to all those who what? Obey. 
Obey. Yeah, are y'all following me? Okay. And having been made perfect, that's why I got a puppy for y'all. Uh, and having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal <coughs> salvation. See, those that don't obey him, they don't get eternal salvation. Those who do, those whose life and their goal and their purpose is to please and obey God. That's the issue. <coughs> 1 Timothy 4.16, it says, Pay close attention to yourself and your, and your teaching. Persevere. Hold to it. Don't quit. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. You know what that means? People are watching you. You say you're saved? Okay, how are you living? You say you're saved? Uh, how do you handle persecution and pressure? Did you just you just stop going to church? You just stop reading your Bible? You just stop praying? You just stop hanging around believers? You just stop doing everything that you were doing when you first started? God says, persevere. If you don't persevere, there's no reason for you to believe that you're saved. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from how? How many? All! All! Unrighteousness. This is, again, we're not talking about a person that has never sinned. That's why we always pray and ask God to forgive us. Because we need, that, that's a continual cleansing. That's sanctification. We're already justified in Christ. We're already made right in Christ through our faith in Him alone. But that, that daily cleansing, that daily washing from those sinful thoughts, words, and, and actions, we ask for God to do that. If we confess, he says, I, I, I'll restore you in right fellowship with me. Hey, have you been out of fellowship with God before? And, and, or just me? Okay, just me. Okay, well, I've been out of fellowship with God before. And, and, and when me and God are not in right fellowship, because nobody else is, but when me and God are not in right fellowship, uh, uh, it bothers. It bothers me. Mm-hmm. Just like it bothers me when my wife and I have issues or when my children and I are not seeing things on the same level. And it breaks the fellowship. It breaks fellowship. You don't communicate the way you do when everything is cool. So we're talking about a relationship. We're talking about with some, some, some deity that's way out there that we can't commune with. We're talking about God of the universe. When you and I sin, it breaks fellowship. He says, but if we confess, and that, that gives evidence that we know that we are in sin, we know that we're doing wrong, and God, I love you so much, I'm going to agree to what you say about my sin. Confess. That's what the word confess means. To say the same thing. You're saying, God, I was wrong. Lord, forgive me. I sinned when I did this. That's all I wanted to hear. Come on back. Let's, let's pick up where we left off at. And God is so gracious. He doesn't, he doesn't bring your sins back up in your face when you make them right. And, 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 and that, isn't that good about God? Amen. So you get a lot of amen in that. But anyway, okay, number four. <laughs> Those who only seek their own will instead of God's will have no reason to assume or believe that they're saved. Why do I say that? Go back to verse 21 in Matthew chapter 7. Look at the B part. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will, he who does the will, the word will denotes desire. We want to do what, what, what pleases God. What God desires, that's what we desire. Those are the, uh, uh, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. John chapter 5 verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own. This is Christ saying this. God in human flesh saying, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I ain't trying to do, have things my way. I ain't Frank Sinatra. I, I'm not trying to have things my way. I'm going to do what God says do. I came here for a purpose. I, I, I have come to do the will of him who sent me. Do you see that? Christ didn't come down here with his own agenda, in other words. Okay, he want me to die, huh? So, okay, well, you know, I don't know about the dying thing. I may, you know, let him hit me a little few times, but I ain't about to die. You know I mean? All right, you know, yeah, I mean, we talked about this thing when we was in, when we was in eternity now, back, you know, before I came down here. You know, but when I get down here, you know, I may change some stuff up. Right. Yeah, because I remember how that cross, you know, you, you were talking about that cross, Lord, and I'm like, that thing hurt. Right. Did he do anything like that? No, no, no. He says, I, I didn't come to do my own will. 
So now here's a question. If Christ didn't come to his own will, and he's God, he can do anything he wants to do. <laughs> so who do you think you are? When you want, to, you want to have this whole Burger King mentality of you just have it your way. No, no, no. no it ain't about your way. No. Have thine own way. We, we like to sing that song. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. But we don't act like that when, when God tells us to do stuff. But a true committed follower of Christ, his desire, her desire is to do the will, the desire of God. Romans chapter 2 verse 8. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey, notice again, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Paul gives a contrast to those who obey God, they get eternal life. He says, but to these people here, who, whose pattern and goal is for selfish goals, selfish ambition, their own kingdom, and not God's kingdom, you're incurring God's wrath. You're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. James chapter 3, verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. There is nothing righteous in a person being selfish. <laughs> There's nothing praiseworthy of an individual having things their own way and never caring about God's way. That is a characteristic of a person that's not saved. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about patterns. I'm talking about, because well, I can be selfish. I mean, I got my Oreos. I mean, it's, you know, it depends on if I, you know, why well, go you go still give me some milk with some ice and you know and, my, and y'all y'all come over to my house and you know and y'all want some cookies all depending what kind of mood I'm in. So I mean I I mean I be filled with the spirit all the time, so I may be selfish. Especially if you're on my last road. But anyway, uh so <laughs> <laughs> So all of us have have those times of, of those kind of desires, but we're talking about a pattern of life where a person only cares about themselves and never about what God cares for or desires. Number five, those who had entered the wide gate and lived on the broad way are the ones who will face Christ as their eternal judge. Did y'all get that? Those who had entered the wide gate and lived on the broad way, those are the ones who will face Christ as their eternal judge. Look again at verse uh, 22. Notice he says, Many will say to me, oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Many. What did we hear many from before? Uh, previous passage we were talking about in, in Matthew uh, uh, 7, uh, verse, verse 14 and verse 13 and 14, it says, Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter it. You see that many? That's the same many that's going to be before God in judgment and saying what? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Oh, and these words, Lord, Lord, are emphatic. Imagine you are already in hell. Now, remember, hell is a holding place. It's kind of like being in, in, you know, kind of being in a holding tank in jail. Before you go to the penitentiary. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Y- y- y'all thought hell? No, no. Hell, hell is a holding place. It's a, pl- it's a place of torment. Well, where, where they're going to be going is ten times worse than, than, than this. They're already suffering, but they're waiting final judgment. That's the second death. See, the first death is when you die. The second death is when you die eternally. Ain't unless burn up to a crisp and then ain't no more. You no no no. This person will consciously, eternally burn. The Bible says their worm will never die. Their bodies will be fit for the lake of fire. So it's none of this. Your your, your flesh is gonna burn off. No 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 no. Your your body is going to burn forever. You'll be in conscious torment forever. No coming back from that. That's why they're saying in verse 22. Many will say to me. Many will say to me. And, and notice what he says. On that day. Not a day. No, he's, he's, he's using a definite day. The day of judgment. Mm-hmm. 
Now, there's two kinds of judgments that the Bible speaks about. You have the great white throne judgment and you have the judgment seat of Christ. I would encourage you to choose the judgment seat, the, the, the Bama seat. That's when you get the rewards for what you do. You don't want the great white throne. You want, you want, to, you want to tell people not to go to the great white throne. You, you, you don't want that one. Because the great white throne, that's when everybody that has never, ever professed Christ as Lord and those who profess but never possess will spend eternity in the lake of fire. But notice what the text says. It says, many will say to me, and notice, notice, notice who they're talking to. See, for those, for those who uh, you may know that holds the oneness Pentecostalism, in other words, that Jesus is not God, Jesus is very much God because they're going to be the ones that they're, that they're standing before in judgment and Christ is going to judge them himself and send them to hell. How do I know that? Look again at verse 21 and verse 22. Not everyone who says to who? Me. To me. He, no, he didn't say my father. Hmm. Verse 22. Many will say to who? Me. me. Capital M. They will, they, they're going to say this to me. The Bible says that he has given all judgment. God has given all judgment to the Son. All judgment. And in humanity, he says, I didn't come to judge the world. Because I thought my job. But I am going to judge the world when, 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 I, when I come back. Hmm. There is going to be a day and I will judge it then. But he says, many will say to me on that day, verse 22, Lord, Lord. Listen, listen to how they're, they're, they're talking now. I mean, they, they, they're probably sincere. Now, of course. They, they probably have, have a realization that this, this is the one he was talking about. There's a sense of pleading with this Lord, Lord. There's a sense of begging. There's a sense of rationalization. A sense of deal making with God. A, a sense of shock. Why do I say that? Notice, he says. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not preach in your name? We did all this. This was a joke. This wasn't real. We, we did all this stuff in your name. These are the people that's on the wide road. Live the broad way. They, 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 they did what they wanted to do. Oh, and by the way, we're not talking about your witnesses. That's obvious. You know where they're going. We're not talking about Mormons. We're not where they're going. We're not talking about Muslims. No, they're going. We're not talking about any false religion. We're not talking about that. That's obvious. We're talking about people who think that they're saved and they're not. This is what Christ is talking about. He's talking about the religious, moral person who got all their I's and T's crossed, but they think that because of what they do, that gives them a one-up on the average pagan. That's self-righteousness. No self-righteous person will enter the kingdom of God. None. This is the person that you and I see every day that professes to be saved, but they shack up. They profess to be saved, but they do the same thing they were doing before they quote-unquote got saved. With no change. This is the hypocrite. This is the person that lives on the down low. This is the person that has a double life. This is the person that plays games with God and think that it's okay. Oh, God knows my heart. These, these are these kind of people. That's why the shock is going to come. Because see, you and I can't see it under the surface. Oh, but God sees everything. He sees everything. He knows everything. And there's a day of reckon reckoning for these people. That's why he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, Kurios, ruler, master, master. They're being, they're being, they're being reverent now. They're, 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 it sounds holy. They're just not holy. It, it, it sounds reverent. It, it sounds all pious and, and sincere, but they're sincerely deceived. I don't know how that shakes you up to hear that people that you think are saved, and you know they're not saved, but they believe that they are, are not going to be in the kingdom. Here's the issue. Here's my question. What are you doing with those people? 
How are you helping the people to see that they're being deceived? Or do you value the friendship? Or do you value the relationship with them because you don't want to offend them? You don't want to lose the relationship. Their soul is on the way to hell, but you're valuing what you can get out of them. Approval. Uh, you, you, you can get uh, uh, success or you can get uh, prestige from them. You don't want to lose anything because if I lose them, then they, they won't talk to me anymore. But then you may lose them eternally. And you will never talk to them. He says, Lord, Lord, many, many will say to me, not a few, Many will say this. Heaven is not going to be full. The disciple says, Lord, are there a few that are going to enter heaven? Are there a few? Because they understood that heaven is not going to be occupied with everybody we think that are going. It's not. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Verse 31 and 32. Jesus says, and he's talking about, this is during a time when he's going to be judging. Um, Verse 31 says, but when the Son of Man comes, notice when, not if, he's coming back. And he's coming back to judge. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It's the day of judgment. When Christ comes back, He is going to judge. And He's going to, do, he's going to be doing the separating. You don't have to worry about us doing it and separating. Because we're not good separators. He's going to separate, the Bible says, the sheep from the goats. 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, they look saved, they talk saved, they even act saved, but it is not genuine salvation. It's a form of godliness. They play the role. They, 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 put on the, they put on the garb, they put on the, the robe, and they have the mask on, all that. They use the same language you and I use. It's a form. But they have no power. They have no power. John chapter 5, verse 22 and 27. It says, for not even the father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the son. Notice, again, we're talking about Christ is the one that's going to be doing the judging. (laughs) He says, he has given all judgment to the son. Verse 27, and he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. He's God. Christ is going to be doing the ultimate judging. Of these false professors. These people who say but don't do. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31. It says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Revelation 20 verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. From whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. Nowhere to run. No excuses. Nobody can speak for you. On that day of judgment, the books are going to be open. And the Bible says the dead are going to be judged by their deeds. See, all of us are going to be judged by deeds. For the Christian, we receive rewards or lose rewards. But for the unbeliever, they lose their soul. There's nothing to get rewards for. The opportunity was given. They rejected that opportunity. And by their deeds, that's what God's going to judge them by. So number six. Those who appear to revere and have a superficial awe of Christ, but are void of genuine faith, will not enter heaven. Those who appear to revere, that means to respect, to, 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 to reverence, to worship, and to have a superficial Surface faith 
a superficial awe of Christ, but are void of genuine faith, will not enter heaven. Go back to Matthew 7. Look again in verse 22. It says, The Lord, Lord. Did you hear the terms? Respectful. They, 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 they have the words down pat now, but it's too late. Remember, remember I talked about the timeline? He says, many will say to me on that day. Well, he's talking about the day of judgment. They will stand in that day of judgment. They've already died. They spent time in hell prior to them getting ready to go to the lake of fire. They're about to be judged eternally, and now they are seeing that all the work that they did meant nothing for the kingdom. That, that is so, so scary to think about that. And, and I, would, I would hate to believe that there's anyone in this room that are playing the part of being a hypocrite. I mean, our, our, our children, they hear the gospel, they, they profess salvation, time will tell. How, how, many, how many little kids make professions of faith and live like the devil when they walk out of mom and daddy's house? So this is not just about adults, this is about kids too. And I want my children to hear this. Because see, it's one thing of saying that you love Christ and that you profess to be saved now, but the true test comes when you walk out the door. The true test comes when you say that you're a Christian and you have to deal with this world. That's why we do what we do here. We're not playing games. We're not going to be teaching little, little skits and little comedy plays. That doesn't mature you. That doesn't save your soul. What's the sense of me hooping and doing all this shouting and there's no holiness and sanctification? What's the sense of me playing and tickling your ears when you walk out the door and you, your, your life has not changed? We teach the Bible because the Bible gives us a way of understanding who God is and it is the roadmap to salvation. Not just words on the page. These people have a superficial awe. They, they appear reverent. They, they, they appear to, 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 to love God. But God knows the heart. No, you don't. They say, Lord, 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 wait, wait, Lord, wait, wait. There's a pleading in their voice. Because they realize all this time. And some of them are probably in hell right now. Realizing. That the life was a joke. The life was a sham. But notice, he, he, he gives us some examples. Look at Matthew 25, 1 to 12. This is, this is so shocking. In Matthew 25, look at verse 1. He says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish, and five were prudent, many wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, look what happened. They took no oil. With, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in their flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone, are going out. But the prudent answer saying, no, there will, be not, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Verse 11. And later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. I don't know you. Ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Both looked like they were the same. Both had the lamps. Both had the appearance of salvation. One had the power of salvation. One had the appearance but had no power. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. The five wise virgins had the power 
of God resonating, living in their lives. This is just, just a, a, a picture of what happens when a person is saved. We have the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in us. You have people who profess to have the power of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have it in their lives. They look the part. They can play the role. But God says, I don't know you. And he's not talking about some intellectual, under, oh, I, I, I don't know. No, no, I have no relationship with you. I, I don't have an intimate fellowship with you. And in 2 Timothy 3, 5, we just, we just read that. Hold into a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. It's a show. It's not real. It's not, it's not genuine. Number seven, teachings about the gospel, healings, miracles, religious zeal, and displays of spiritual power do not always necessarily validate a true follower of Christ. Did you get that? Teachings about the gospel, healings, miracles, religious zeal, that's passion like like I have. I'm very demonstrative. Somewhat charismatic. And to my tongue, I'm just saying just my attitude, my, 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 pers- my personality is very charismatic, very winsome. That doesn't validate my ministry. That doesn't validate me being a true follower of Christ. Oh, look at me. He preaches so good. I mean, he preaches. I mean, you've heard people say this. You've heard people say this. Oh, my pastor, he preaches the word. And then you turn on the TV. Or oh, you listen to the tape. Or oh, hear a sermon. You're like, that's the word? They didn't, say, they didn't say nothing. They say absolutely nothing. There was nothing that they, they didn't interpret that was correct at all. And, and your, your pastor preaches the word. And you don't want to use the word expositional. Oh, what's that? Don't even worry about it. Verse by verse. Did he preach verse? Oh, yeah, he preached verse by verse. Oh, yeah, he do that. Yeah, yeah, he do that. And, and he just give you stories. You start, the, you start the worship service off with a skit. Or a play. Or drama. Oh, because cause see, that gets people's attention. Yeah, they may get their attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if somebody walk in my door, that'll get my attention. So what does that mean? But does that arrest the soul? Does that challenge the person to understand that they're standing in the presence of a holy God to whom they must give an account one day? If it doesn't do that, that's just song and dance. It's just games. Oh, by the way, Christ didn't use drama to win people to him. He just said, follow me. It's just two words. Follow me. And they follow. No, no, well, we, well, we're in the 21st century. I mean, because, you know, they didn't have PowerPoint back in the day. Right, they didn't have PowerPoint back in the day. They had the word. They didn't have microphones either. George Whitfield had no microphone. Thousands came to Christ by this man's message. No microphone, no show, no song and dance, no, no, no band. Just the word. And people came because of the message. Well, what are you here for? Why do you come? What, what do you desire from God? Most importantly, what, is he, what does he desire from you? He desires obedience. He expects Obedience. He does not expect people who profess but don't possess. But he says, many will say, Lord, Lord, look again at the text, verse 22. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name? Notice, three times they used the term your name. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name? Notice. He said, Lord, we're doing this for you. So we thought. I mean, people got, I, people got, people came down the aisle in your name. People was amen in my sermons in your name. Healing was happening in your name, Lord. And you say this was a joke? This was, this was all a game? Yeah. 
Yeah, you are the joke and you're the game. And notice why am I saying that? Because I'm not saying that it can't happen. I'm not saying that a person can't be saved through a false professor. And I'll show you in the text why I can support that. I'm not reaching out to something that's in the air and just trying to bring it for y'all to just to approve it and say amen to it. I'm going to show you in the text that this is why I'm saying this. Because false preachers or false teachers don't always speak lies. Hope you understand that. Crypto Dollar doesn't always speak lies. Some stuff he says is true, although he's a false teacher. Mm-hmm. Are you understand what I'm saying? Yes, man. Benny Hinn, he may say some things true sometimes. It's rare. Very rare. <laughs> very, rare. Very, very rare, like 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 a steak. Very rare. <laughs> but he's still a false prophet. He's still a false teacher. I.V. Hilliard does not always say everything a lot. Though he's a false teacher. It's not about the issue of people being a false teacher because we're saying they're a false teacher. No. Why are they a false teacher? That's the issue. And this is the issue that Christ is bringing up in the text. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, if possible, even the elect. Who are the elect? Christians. We are Christians. If it was possible, we would be deceived. If, possible? if it was possible. Thank God it's not. Amen. Matthew 27, 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife, this is Pilate's wife, Miss Pilate, had a bad dream. Now notice, I'm giving you all this because I'm showing you that not all the time a person that says that God can use false teachers for his own purpose. He can use unbelievers for his own purpose. Matthew 27, 19 is one of them. He said his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that. Notice, she calls Jesus righteous. Now, now how can an unbeliever know the difference between righteousness and unrighteousness? She says, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. In a dream. Miss Pilate had some insomnia going on. Couldn't couldn't sleep. Maybe her name was Pontiacia. I don't know. Her name was Pontius Pilate. Maybe Pontiacia. I don't know. Maybe possibly. But nonetheless. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Verse 38 to 40. I'm just giving you some examples in the text and showing you how even God can use false teachers for his own purpose. Mark chapter 9, verse 38. John said to him, Teacher, we, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. Verse 39, Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Notice, he wouldn't have followed other disciples, right? But, the text says, he was casting out demons. And verse 40 says, he was not against us, it's for us. Although he's not one of the twelve, he's casting out demons. And the apostles didn't say that he was doing it falsely. He said, you, you, you ain't part of the clique. How are how you, how you doing this, dude? You, you're not part of the twelve? I'm about to tell Jesus on you. He said, dude, don't, 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 don't trip, dude. He, he, he good. Don't worry about it. If he's not against us, he, he's for us. But that's an example of why, how God can use a person to even do something like that. John chapter 11, verse 51, 52. Turn there. John 11, verse 51 and 52. Caiaphas, high priest, prophesied about Christ going to the cross. Didn't even know it. How do we know? Verse 51. We'll go to verse, go to verse uh, 50. He says, No do take into account 
that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Now he, now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Do you see that? And that's us too. And this is Caiaphas, an unbeliever, prophesying about Christ going to the cross and didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. Romans chapter 10, turn there, verse 1 and 2. Romans 10, 1 and 2 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in according to knowledge. They got all the passion, they got all the fervor, they got all the hype. All of that, but no knowledge. And this knowledge is not information. This knowledge is personal, personal, intimate experience. They don't know God. Although they look like they do, Paul says they don't. How do we know that? Look again at verse, look again at verse 3. He says, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They had zeal without knowledge. They looked apart, but did not have a right relationship. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn there. Verse 8 through 10. Second Thessalonians 2. Verse 8. He says, Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming, that is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and what? False wonders. False wonders. Verse 10. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. God says, okay, you don't want the truth? I'll send you a lie. So it's not always people that you think are false teachers, are false teachers, are false prophets. Sometimes it can be the very people that we support. Remember Demas? Remember Judas? Started off very well. But ended in destruction. I'm going to close with this quote. William Henderson gives this quote. I want us to see this because this, this ties in to what we're talking about in verse 22. And I want you to see that there has to be a balance when we talk about False teachers, false teaching, and what people do, and we try to validate a person's ministry 100% of the time based on what they do. That is not always the case. Henderson quotes this. He says, quote, The question that divides commentators is, were these these genuine products of supernatural power, or were they fraudulent or fake? 2 Thessalonians 2.9 And 10 teaches that in connection with the coming of the lawless one, there will be a mighty display of power, signs, and wonders, all of them false. Acts 19, 13, and 14 shows that when the seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, tried to imitate Paul's exercise of miraculous power, their attempt of exorcism failed miserably. There was also the similar failure of Egypt's magicians to reproduce the third plague, which failure, as many see it, sheds doubt on the genuine character of their earlier successes. Does not all this point to the possibility that also the demon expulsions and other mighty works of which the false prophets of Matthew 7, 22 boast had been nothing but sham? Have not investigations proved again and again that among false prophets, illusions, trickery, sleight of hand, etc. abound and that what is presented as genuine is very often nothing but deception? 
and he uses the Latin word populus vote the sepi, the people wish to be deceived. All this, however, must not blind us to the fact that by God's permission, Satan at times exerts influence upon the physical as well as upon the moral or spiritual realm, as is clear from the book of Job. It is not possible that by God's power and or permission, Egypt's magicians had been enabled to change rods into serpents. Note, however, that in each case, the one recorded in the book of Job and the one described in Exodus, the end result was a victory for the Lord and for his people. It is not unnecessary to exclude the possibility that among the feats of which the false prophets are now boasting, there have been some that were accomplished by aid of supernatural power, whether divine or satanic. Similarly, it is entirely possible, probable even, that the men whom Jesus condemns had actually spoken many a true word when they prophesied in the name of Jesus. Is it not true that the Lord at times makes use of the wicked to proclaim marvelous truths? Demas may have preached many a fine sermon. And was not even Judas Iscariot among those who were commissioned to heal the sick and to cast out demons? The reason why the men described here in Matthew 7.22 are condemned is not that their preaching had been wrong and or their miracle spurious, but that they had not practiced what they preached. That's the issue. And I told y'all, it was not the issue about them doing the works. It was a heart motivation behind why they did it or their heart condition. They preach, but don't practice. And we'll find out why Jesus says that next time. Let's pray. Lord, we are concerned and we are even somewhat scared of the fact that there are many who profess many who claim to be saved but have no right relationship with you even people in our own families people that profess to know you as Savior and Lord but yet their lives do not imitate that of a changed life Father you have called us to be on a rescue operation to rescue the perishing to to help those who are blind to see the truth of your word. And Lord, we know it is not popular. But nonetheless, it is what you have called us to do. Father, give us strength to do that task. Help us, Lord, to examine ourselves. We, we know that we sometimes look at other people. But Father, help us to do introspection of our own hearts. That we are those who have been truly called to the faith that we proclaim. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.